Well, hi everybody, and welcome to Tea with Jesus for this week. Now, last week I went ahead and just took some time talking about how that Jesus is truly God the Son. And um, so I told you last week that I thought we'd probably be definitely going into Romans 7 uh, this week, as we had completed Romans 6. So yes, we are going to be going into Romans 7. And um, Paul is really putting a lot into helping the church in Rome and everyone who's ever read this letter, helping all of us to really gain a better understanding of what is it in our life that would possibly give us the ability to live a life that is holy, that is is pleasing to God. Um, what role does the law have in all of this? Uh, what role does our own efforts have in it? There, there's so much that if we can really understand Romans, there's so much that we will have a greater understanding in our life about, about what salvation has really all been about. Um, it is a challenging book, but really, really good. <laughs> So I want to go ahead now, and um, for this week, we're going to do Romans 7, and we're going to do verses 1 through 13. And as we complete Romans 7 and get into Romans 8, um, we're going to be getting into a chapter of the Bible that I just think is full of some of the greatest, richest, wonderful truth um, all of this has been great, um, but I just, I dearly love Romans 8. There was a time in my life where I had the entire chapter memorized. I um, have to admit, I have not kept all of that up. I've just got passages of it, but um, I'm, I'm excited to be in this part of the Bible right now. All right, Romans 7, 1 through 13. Now, dear brothers and sisters, you who are familiar with the law, don't you know that the law applies only while a person is living? For example, when a woman marries, the law binds her to her husband as long as he is alive. But if he dies, the laws of marriage no longer apply to her. So while her husband is alive, she would be committing adultery if she married another man. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law and does not commit adultery when she remarries. So my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ. And now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. When we were controlled by our old nature, sinful desires were at work within us. And the law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds resulting in death. But now we have been released from the law. For we died to it and are no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the Spirit. Well then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said, you must not covet. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have that power. At one time I lived without understanding the law. But when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came to life, and I died. So I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me. But still, the law itself is holy, and its commands are holy and right and good. But how can that be? Did the law, which is good, cause my death? Of course not. Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death. So we can see how terrible sin really is. It uses God's good commands for its own evil purposes. I have really prayed and dug in as I've looked at these scriptures um, for us to really try to get at the heart of what Paul is really saying here. I'm just going to start out by saying that a couple things that we want to really remember as we're looking at this in more depth. 
The one is that the law was never intended to be our way to salvation or even or to righteousness. God knows that we just can't do it. Um, the law has been important because it's shown us how much we need that salvation, how much we need the change in our life. Um, the closer we are to the power of God in our life, the closer we are to Him, the more there can be a joy and um, a freedom to please Him rather than feeling bound to law. We're going to be getting into more, into more depth with this. I wanted to start out by reading something that is based back again, um, just very quickly here, on um, the sixth chapter of Romans, verse 23, Romans 6, 23. This little passage was written by Dr. Jack Hayford and M.A. or Pat Robertson. Um, it's in my, uh, I found it in my New Spirit-Filled Life Study Bible from um, Thomas Nelson. Um, it is a New Living Translation. But I just thought this was very powerful when we talk about what is the difference between sinning and being in bondage to sin and being an obedient servant of God. It's on the wages of sin from Romans 6.23. It has been said, oh, this is so powerful. It has been said that sin is first pleasing, then easy, then delightful, then frequent, and then habitual. The person then becomes a confirmed sinner, then obstinate, then resolved never to repent, and then he is ruined. A wage was a, a ration or a stipend that originally was associated with a soldier in military service. You know, that, that was what a soldier got paid. Today it means payment for work done or recompense for work. So this passage is inferring that sin is work. It is toil or labor for hire. Sin is a battle against godliness and it will bring dominance by a satanic overlord. Sin is a slave-driving taskmaster that demands total commitment and ultimate death. We've got to recognize it for what it is. But the word gift, you know that scripture says, the free gift of God. The word gift, which is the Greek charisma, suggests a divine gratuity, something given. That is a deliverance from danger or passion that's going to lead into danger. Specifically, it's a spiritual endowment. Endowment is where something has been given for a certain purpose. Um, if you look at it objectively, it's a miraculous faculty, an ability that is miraculous. It is divine influence upon your heart and its reflection in your life. So sin works you, but righteousness rewards you. God gives us the ability to choose his grace or the wages of sin. Sin is actually more burdensome than just the very grace of God in our life. Let's take just a moment and go to Galatians 5.16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. You know, the Lord's grace is there for us. Um, I also want to look in Romans 12, 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You see, we have to understand that we cannot, we just can't use the law to become righteous. And these two verses talk about that the power to be able to obey God is going to come from His very power in our life. So as we're getting into chapter 7 here, um, as we look at the beginning of it, um, Paul is using an example 
to show that um, a person can be free from the, the bondage that can happen if they're trying to serve God only under the law. Um, it says that, you know, you don't, you know that the law applies only when a person's living. And then it goes on to say in verses 2 and 3 that, you know, when a woman is married, the law binds her to her husband as long as he's alive. If he dies, the laws of marriage no longer apply to her. And, um, you know, she'd be committing adultery if she married another man while her husband's still alive. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law and doesn't commit adultery when she remarries. Now, Paul really here is, um, is illustrating, using this illustration about freedom from the law and using an, a marriage as an analogy. Uh, the death of one partner will free the other um, from a commitment that, you know, should be lifelong. But we want to remember that the subject here actually isn't divorce or remarriage, but a Christian's relationship to a system called the law. Paul's speaking here in general terms. He's not making detailed qualifications, and his statements here shouldn't be, um, shouldn't seem to be uh, everything we need to know about the grounds for divorce or remarriage. So he's just using this as an example of being freed from the bondage of the law. Um, there, there are things that Jesus said about divorce and remarriage that I want to take just a quick look at here, and that will be in um, Matthew 19, 9. And I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery, unless his wife has been unfaithful. And that, of course, goes the other way around, too, um, unless, the husband, you know, unless the husband has been unfaithful. I think one of the things I really want us to understand here is uh, the whole concept of legalism. It creates a lot of serious, real problems. Um, Jesus himself dealt with severe legalism among the, um, the Pharisees. And we're going to be talking about how that they, they made themselves look all good on the outside and they weren't on the inside. And they were demanding things of people that they, they could not fulfill themselves. And Jesus called them on it a lot. If we are relying on our ability to follow every single bit of the law, so that we can make ourselves good enough for God and for each other, then we are really functioning within legalism. And this is not what the law was given for, so that we could become all legalistic. On the one hand, if we try to live that way, if we try to somehow make sure that we are just getting ourselves all straightened up, um, it, it really will ultimately bring about discouragement and hopelessness because we are going to keep failing. And let's think about it. Uh, laws, there are laws that are absolutely given by God. It's talking about that here in, in the Word that God gave them. People also decide on a lot of rules for each other. And they interpret things that there has to be things done a certain way. And um, there's no way in the world that any human being uh, on their own could ever fulfill all that God has asked and then people heap more on top of it and so we get more and more discouraged we we can't seem to take care of it ourselves and so we have this bad tendency to kind of avoid spending time with God until we've gotten ourselves straightened up if we've done something wrong we've got to get sorry and repentant enough somehow to go to him and, and talk to the Lord about it. We isolate ourselves because we're just not good enough. Uh, we're not squared away enough to be able to go to God. And that isolation is really dangerous. Um, that's when we can become more susceptible to um, hearing the deception of the enemy and to not trusting God's faithfulness and not trusting his love. If we're not going to go to Jesus in trust and confidence that he'll welcome us, then we are going to start trying to do things on our own. And that is a dangerous place to be. It really is. Um, 
we have to know that, and I've said this before, and we've got to get it sunk into us really deeply, there's nothing in our life that's going to surprise Jesus. And if we are going, you know, to praying with a lot of, of false bravado to make sure we're impressing someone and we're not being really honest with the Lord, that's probably not going to do us a whole lot of good. But there's, it's always good and always safe as a Christian to just be honest before the Lord, just to go to Him exactly where we are. Um, if we give Him that time and we, we really are honest about what's going on, we are going to, he's going to make such a difference in our life. He knows we're, he knows we, we are f failures. <laughs> he knows that we struggle. We're not going to have hope apart from him. And we're going to be talking about the, the power that's in our life because we have the very presence of God in us. We can't, we don't, oh my goodness, we shouldn't be running from that. We should be thankfully embracing it. And then there's another way that this legalism works. You know, one is for people to become just incredibly discouraged and feel like they're never, ever going to be good enough for the Lord. And they run from him. And the other is that, kind of like the Pharisees that I was just speaking of, we will have a tendency then to try to make sure our outside looks good to everybody, especially if we're in a really legalistic atmosphere. And we are going to be hiding who we really are and what our true struggles are. And that tends to make any of us really judgmental of others also. Um, I can't believe how often, as Christians, we are judging those that are not saved and completely upset with them because they don't live by God's standard. Well... They don't even, they don't have the power of God in them to even do anything different. Their issue isn't how bad their sin is. They do need to recognize that it is sin, but their issue is that they need the Lord. And then when we try to take especially a young Christian and heap so many demands on this person that they're just weighed under them, we are not truly reflecting the way that the Holy Spirit wants to work in a person's life um, when they're a Christian, when they know Jesus. So we will end up judging others. You know, God doesn't want us to take disobedience lightly. But our only hope of living as close to a sinless life as we can, as pleasing of a life as we can, is in our relationship that we have with Jesus and God the Father, and the constant presence of the Holy Spirit. We don't have the power to be sinless, but God has that power. The Holy Spirit does. And, you know, talking about us trying to have uh, this outside look real good, you know, but we're not being honest about how we're struggling inside. I want to go to a, a pretty famous little passage in 1 Samuel 16, 7. Um, God had sent Samuel to um, go to David's family. He had a bunch of older brothers, but he was to anoint young David as the next king after Saul. And so um, if we, I'm going to start with verse 6 here. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, oh, surely this is the Lord's anointed because he seemed much more impressive than David. But this is what I want us to hear. Verse 7, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height. For I have rejected him, Eliab, the other brother. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God knows what's going on inside of us. And he knows what we're trying so hard to do. And he also knows when we're pretending and playing mind games and trying to fake everybody out that we are in better shape than we are. All of which can be a result of legalism. I, I just see it drive people away from the power that God wants to have in their life because they're taking this incredible salvation that Jesus has provided and they're turning it back into a bunch of rules that we have to follow in order to be okay. That has not been God's desire. Now we're talking about that we have the very presence of God in us. Let's look at a couple of really, really wonderful scriptures. Um, I want to go to Colossians 1, 27. Now we want to remember that 
one of the things that happens when we become saved, when we give our life to Christ, is that the Holy Spirit indwells us. He comes and indwells us. And um, I want to look here in verse 27. For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit indwell us through the Holy Spirit. Let's go ahead and also look in Colossians 2, 9. It's just right here on the same page. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. Um, they are very much one. And we have that very power dwelling in us as Christians. If we can know that and really realize what that means, there is a, a way through love and power in our life that we can walk pleasing to the Lord. But it's not going to be because we don't need him and we're going to do it ourselves. It doesn't work that way. So the true purpose of the law isn't to make us righteous, but it has shown us what sin is. Let's go back to Romans 7 and look here at verse 6. But now we have been released from the law, for we died to it and, no longer, and are no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the Spirit. That is where the power comes from. The law never was going to give us the power to become holy. It just showed us how far from holy we are and how much we have needed a Savior. There's a wonderful note in here that I wanted to share. Um, it says in verse 8, but sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have that power. And you know, I think we have to be honest that as soon as we're told not to do something, it starts becoming very interesting to us. We have a real sin nature that you want to get uh, somebody to, to want to do something, tell them they're forbidden to do it. Um, it's just kind of the way we are. And um, I want to just look at this little note here. I thought it was really good. If there were no law, sin would be dormant, but the law aroused a desire to do that which it forbade. The same is true of every Christian. Now, listen to this. The more we are subjected to do's and don'ts without knowing how to yield to the enabling power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill such requirements, the more we will sin. In other words, if we are trying to rely on our own efforts to make sure we do what the law says, we're going to get more, have more and more of a tendency to sin. The law needs to show us how much we need to go to God to see what he wants and to let his power be at work in our life. So if we look in verses 9 and 10, it's talking about how the law has made us aware of our sin and has shown us that we are spiritually dead, um, separated spiritually from God. That's what the death is. It's a separation. Um, at one time I lived, verse 9 and 10, at one time I lived without understanding the law, but when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came to life, and I died. So I discovered that the law's commands, which are supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. This doesn't mean that as soon as Paul found out he wasn't supposed to covet something, he keeled over and died. It's It's Sin brings about a separation from God. And so when he knew not to covet, and then he coveted, there, there was sin in his life. Um, the law makes us aware of our sin. If we didn't have the law, we would not know how far we are from God and, and how much we've been separated from him and how much we need to restore that relationship. And then I want to read uh, verses 11 through 13. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. Sin did. It used the commands to kill me, to bring about that spiritual death. But still, the law itself is holy, and its commands are holy and right and good. But how can that be? Did the law which is good cause my death? No, of course not. Of course not. Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death. 
so we can see how terrible sin really is. It uses God's good commands for its own evil purposes. Um, it all boils down to disobedience, to choosing to not obey our very holy and, and mighty God. We can't blame the law. The law is just showing what God's holy standard really is. Um, to understand what goodness is, what is purity, um, what is love, all these things that are there, God. Um, we can't blame the law if we've had problems. We've got to blame sin. God's law reflects his holiness, but the law cannot make us clean and righteous. I know I've said that over and over, but it's there to show us how much we need to get cleaned up, that we are not righteous. And the more we can understand that, um, and that that's why Jesus came and paid that penalty so he could be forgiven, and that we have the power of God, the presence of God living in us as Christians, then we can see that the law is just, it's a reflection of how beautiful, incredible God is and how good he is. But we can't do what's pleasing apart from his power. And we were, we were and would be lost apart from that very power of Jesus. I'm going to take just a moment here and just go ahead to the beginning of Romans 8. Now, next week, I'm going to go, I'm just going to slide right from Romans 7, 14 through 25 into the beginning of Romans 8. Because, you know, this letter wasn't written with chapter designations and verse designations. Those are there to help us be able to find our way around in the scriptures. But I love how the, what he's saying in 7, how that goes right into uh, what he says then in chapter 8. We have amazing hope because of Jesus. Romans 8, 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Wow. So we'll be looking at that and, you know, that can't be a license to just do anything we could ever possibly want to do and God's not ever going to mind. Um, sin, disobedience brings about destruction and sometimes even if a Christian um, just willfully stays in a sin. That doesn't mean there's not going to be some probably natural consequences and other consequences to it. Sin is serious stuff. But our power to be free is, is here. We have that power. And um, we can live a life, as long as it's honest before the Lord, we can live a life that's pleasing before the Lord. Uh, I'm going to think of one example really quickly that I think is a really important one. And then next week, we'll be getting into uh, Romans 7, 14. And um, the example I want, I want to bring up is uh, a very important but difficult thing for us to obey, and that is forgiveness. And um, I've had to be very careful as I've been doing these Bible studies to be as blunt about forgiveness as the Bible is. Um, it is a hard thing for us to live in and walk in. It's a hard thing for us to, to do. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our life to be able to forgive and to forgive again and to live that kind of a life. Um, we have to understand the destructive power unforgiveness has in our life. We are not going to be able to be forgiving because we're going to grit our teeth and just say, all right, I forgive you. I, we can't. We just can't handle things that seem so unforgivable. But the Lord can give us the power to choose with his strength to be obedient and to have a heart that will let things go and forgive. So even as Christians, we can't just say, well, it doesn't matter whether I forgive or not, because unforgiveness has consequences. Um, Jesus was very, very blunt about how that if we're not willing to forgive, then we will not be receiving forgiveness. Now that is a heavy statement if there ever was one. But I'm not going to live in fear because all I have to do is say, Lord, show me where I'm not forgiving. And then, Lord, I don't even know if I can come up with the desire to be forgiving. So please, Lord, just help me to have the desire. And I want to be obedient to you.
Change my heart. Fill me with your love, Lord, and help me to walk in the kind of forgiveness that you have had toward me. You see, I don't have to live in fear, but I better take forgiving seriously. And that's just one example I can kind of think of that, that um, this talks about the importance of obedience, and yet God knows that we need his power to obey. Yeah. Let's pray. Lord, I guess since I've just been talking about forgiveness, I just really want to pray that for everyone listening, for everyone that's involved here, show us our heart and help us to find the joy and the freedom there is in forgiving and in letting your love be at work in our life. And Lord, I pray that we will have the same kind of heart that you have had toward us and toward others and how you have so often forgiven what seems like it shouldn't be forgivable. But Lord, you do. You've chosen to forgive. You paid a great price to forgive. And Lord, I just, I love you and I ask that we gain an understanding of what a gift the law has been and yet that we can't rely on slapping that law into our life or anybody else and expect to become righteous. Lord, please just help us to see ourselves as humbly forgiven because of the blood of Jesus and to see others the way you see them and as forgiven if they'll just let you forgiven by, by the shedding blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for that. Lord, give us courage in these hard times to stand up for you, to speak boldly for you, to take every opportunity we can to give the one real, true hope and solution this messed up world needs, and that's Jesus, that's you, Lord. So, Lord, help us to, to trust you when it's really hard. Please bring healing when people have been sick. Um, may your perfect love cast out fear. And Lord, we, oh, we need you to guide us, to give us strength, to be with us, of course, Lord, every single moment. And I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we'll have a live service streaming from our church at 11 o'clock every Sunday morning, Eastern Standard Time. Um, it's interactive at that time, which is kind of fun. In fact, I'll be one of the ones interacting this Sunday on there. Um, and then after that, it will be on YouTube. There is a link, a uh, little orange circle in the end screen with arrows, and there is a link in the description below. Please find a church where you can be with people and interacting and praying together and fellowshipping together. But if there's anywhere a church service can bless you and um, you know, be one more thing God can bring into your life, then we'd love to have you join us. All right, guys. Um, thank you for, oh, for just sharing this with me. My goodness. I. I really, truly consider this an incredible privilege. I'm sending you all a big hug. All right, I love you guys. Bye-bye. Well, till next time.